There it is. Okay, so we'll be starting the session now. My name is Marta Buchonza. I have the pleasure of chairing this session. We have two presentations. And we will start with Emilia Sieczka uh, from the Polish Academy of Sciences. And Emilia will speak for about 20 minutes about Polish intelligentsia. Emilia, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you a lot. Um, I have a pleasure to talk to my peers. <laughs> um, Mm. So most of you being here already know some basic insight about like this project and like the bigger project uh, within which uh, we are working as a team with uh, Professor Buchholz. Um, it is a project dedicated to national habitus formation and the process of civilization in Poland after 1989, as it is stated on a slide. And um, and today I will try to propose the, the perspective to consider um, the history of uh, hmm, what I would call um, identity formation of intelligentsia, or intelligentsia in English, um, rather than intelligentsia itself, um, as I will use this perspective of Hotzblom, um, like in order to show um, the perspective of um, Mm, discussing this issue more through the cultural production of um, high culture. <clears throat> so the text uh, that's basically mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> too much of a green. Uh, sorry. Mm. So, since the conference is dedicated to, um, to Hotzblom, um, I decided to base my presentation on uh, the text from 1986 on the high and low in society and in sociology, a semantic approach to social stratification. Um, and uh, in this text, uh, Hotzblom proposes like, a very um, witty critique of uh, stratification uh, theories. And... Uh, and proposes the um, perspective in which like, uh, we could rather um, concentrate on how uh, the notion of um, high and low is uh, reinforced through certain stratification uh, theory um, as um, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so to cite um, like the master of this, Event, an obtrusive participant observation and analysis of historical and literacy documents may perhaps reveal more clearly how people using the high and low image actually define social relationships. The study of social stratification seems to have been dominated too long by the theoretical debate about functional explanations of stratification on the one hand, a debate in which the meaning of the high-low metaphor has seldom been questioned, and by the accumulation of survey data about occupational prestige in various societies on the other. A much-needed empirical endeavor in which, however, strict observance of technical statistical procedures has tended to obscure the substantive problem of how the prestige scales thus constructed relate to actual social conduct and social structure. Mm, and then mm, Hotzblam mm, does, um, well, like, describe certain, what I would call like a a satire on uh, like certain endeavors uh, trying to measure prestige, but also um, projecting um, the notion of high and low through, through those studies uh, on the prestige, uh, suggesting that those studies are kind of constructing the prestige themselves. Mm, for the parliament hand, this means that we should take the words high and low very seriously as indicators and to a certain extent determinants of a certain type of social order. But we should not immediately grant them the state of, of unambiguous sociological concepts as it is too often done in textbooks. A greater semantic awareness, such as advocated here, a direct bearing on the methods we choose for our investigations. 
The questionnaire method, while being the most efficient tool of social research developed so far, is a notably weak instrument for discovering the relationship between words and deeds. In the area of social certification, this instrument has been used for constructing occupational prestige case based upon verbal responses. We should not exclude the possibility that the hierarchies thus discovered were at least partially generated by the published results of previous surveys. It may well be that, to most of its members, the pecking order of modern society is largely opaque. Publication of occupational prestige scales as scientific findings may then serve to many as a means of orientation in an otherwise purely structured perception field and may thus have the unintended effect of a self fulfilling prophecy. Mm. So, basing on the text, I mm, came up with certain proposition of how it could be referred to the case study um, about which I will be talking, uh, but also how to hmm, come up with, uh, well, certain ways in, um, in which we could situate this uh, cultural construction of high and low uh, within the established and outsider um, theory. Mm, so methodological conclusion that we can draw from, from this paper of Hosblom, um, to me is that um, this intellectual history of how the hierarchies and certification theories are produced um, have been rather neglected by the sociology. So we are more, still we are more like dealing with like certification theories and like applying them without much of a, um, of a concern of um, how certain theories and certain notions uh, as such uh, might be reinforcing um, so-called class differences, if we could use like this perspective of the classes in the first place. Um, within this framework, and um, and I will argue that like the case of Polish intelligentsia, um, that is um, considered as this paradoxical superstructural class, um, can be a good illustration of that problem. Um, so um, basically, um, as you probably know. There is like a very specific Eastern European context um, within which the intelligentsia is um, operating. So uh, in the Eastern European context, intelligentsia doesn't uh, den denounce uh, the intellectual uh, strata of society. It is more like a, a strata uh, that um, within like the literature, uh, the current literature is considered as uh, like post-noble group um, that were constructed within the situation uh, when um, the Polish nobility encountered the problem of like um, social reproduction. Um, so uh, the noblemen, because of the partitions, uh, they uh, got downgraded and um, depraved of the like, traditional rights of like being noblemen um, and in order to kind of uh, compensate uh, and uh, to, to kind of counteract to this uh, downgrade, um, they frequently occupied uh, the positions um, that like within this Buddhism perspective could be considered as, um, as characteristic to uh, those occupations uh, connected to uh, high cultural capital. So in other words, being deprived of their status and mostly also downgraded economically because of a high inefficiency of like this post-feudal economy, um, they relied on cultural capital. Mm. And this is like the narrative that is dominating in, in the field in, in Poland um, on this topic. And, um, mm, and like in my experience of dealing with this, mm, with this topic, um, I encountered this problem that like this paper of uh, Hotzblom seems to be resolving a bit. Um, that is to what extent like this notion of cultural capital and that there is like a high and low cultural capital uh, presupposes that 
um, that actually uh, that, uh, that cultural capital is something like objective and um, and it's like difficult to grasp within this processual um, perspective where we should consider like high and low culture within like the group relationships mm. and therefore it seems that um, while studying this problem of like um, Polish intelligentsia mm, that is like um, still a um, common sort of identity uh, in Poland. Um, we might rely on this established and outsider uh, perspective. Mm. And, um, and now I'm going to like describe more how we could do that. So, um, so because um, at first in the 18th century, um, the nobility had a monopoly um, over the education. Um, the attempts in modernizing um, the state, but also in modernizing the, um, the social structure, um, relied a lot on this um, um, on this um, transformation of like uh, feudalism into a certain meritocracy. But because still the noblemen were the only people that were allowed to get education, um, actually this uh, transformation was more cosmetic than like the um, substantial sort of uh, transformation. So, um, so in a way, um, they moved from like this, um, well, um, feudal source of prestige towards the meritocratic uh, source of prestige, but actually uh, without using the very social monopoly. Um, and then we have um, this situation that like with growing rationalization processes and like, um, or as we may argue here um, in this conference, um, that is also embedded in like civilizing process, um, we can also think about it as um, well opening up and like a democratization process in terms of um, how the education um, was um, was more um, egalitarian and uh, and this is also something very characteristic for the uh, 20th century um, when um, we had this moment of rapid industrialization um, in the People's um, Republic of Poland. And, um, and what happened is that because of industrialization and because of growing states entrepreneurship, uh, more and more non-manual workers um, were needed, uh, which uh, brought about um, a lot of educational reforms so that the education um, stopped to be associated solely with this so-called high culture and more and more um, and became more and more associated with um, with technical competences um, and it all happened uh, in this um, specific background where um, um, where we can kind of project um, the problem of like um, expansion of um, of this um, non-manual um, work field on the problem of like Polish sovereignty, and um, as um, um, as like Polish people uh, republic uh, was popularly considered by the high strata of the society as. Um, 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 as imposed externally uh, for the Soviet Union as we belong to the Eastern Bloc. Mm. And, um, mm. and um, within this established and outside the perspective, my idea, mm, which is based on like the research that, um, that I've done um, on the topic, was that like every time 
the educational reform was introduced and every time um, the access to, to the education became more uh, widespread, um, there was like a certain resistance within like this high strata um, of society, this uh, intelligentsia, uh, when they were um, frequently debating about the possible boundaries um, of who could actually be a proper uh, intelligent. Because um, for a long time, like this um, position of um, an intelligent um, was solely dependent on the education um, that was um, um, sorry um, on the um, education of the people, but um, within this um, industrialization process and within like this process of like new reforms, um, like this position when only uh, the noblemen and the descendants of the noblemen were granted this privilege of uh, educating themselves, um, it was uh, compromised and uh, therefore intelligentsia was looking for, for a way um, to secure his position somehow. Um, which could be seen within this established and outsider logic as like expanding um, the amount of educated people and um, and we could look at certain texts through this perspective of what were like the strategies of uh, those that were already part of, of this group um, in order to secure their superiority. And of course, basing on the uh, establishment outsider theory, uh, well, we can draw some hmm, assumptions of how it could have worked. So for instance, like we know um, that, uh, well, as, as was codified by uh, Elias and Scottson, that like the blame gossip tends to be involved. And we also know that um, the glorification of, of the past is also uh, heavily involved, and um, and like initially in this presentation, I wanted to make this uh, mm, this big picture of the whole uh, body of the text from the 18th to the uh, 21st century, mm, but to um, make it maybe mm, somehow quicker, but also more in depth in order to show. Um, what um, what is actually attractive about like, this method and about this possibility of combining um, Hotzblom with uh, with the established outsider theory uh, is that that um, I would concentrate only on this um, moment when uh, when actually this working intelligentsia uh, emerged and um, and of course. Mm. In the text that I prepared, all these like um, classic um, uh, strategies of like the established are heavily present. Uh, but also, what is interesting is that if we looked at the sociological text uh, of the period. Um, we might discover that uh, what Hotzblom um, wrote about this uh, construction of, of, of the high in, uh, in relation to, to, to the low uh, could be also um, used. Um, so as Hotzblom uh, wrote, further support for this interpretation may be found in the empirical study by Harriet Moore and Gerhard Kleining of the way a German dog worker perceives social certification. According to the analysis, the dog worker sees as the main distinguishing feature of the highest rate of freedom and of the lowest rate of lack of freedom. People in the highest rate, in his view, possess the means to arrange their lives as they see fit. There are no obstacles to prevent them from fulfilling their wishes and from leading a worthwhile life. 
People in the lowest strata but contrast are prey to forces beyond their control. They have no access to the reality, to the really valuable thing in life, and they cannot sufficiently command their own dark impulses. And uh, that can be seen uh, in the text by one of the most distinguished sociologists um, at the time, um, who wrote a text about this distinction precisely. What is the distinction between um, proper intelligentsia and, um, and those who are merely uh, intellectual workers? And um, so, in his perspective, um, the real intelligent uh, is the one who is characteristic by independence and creativity, um, which is um, associated with this like natural tendency uh, towards freedom and towards like artistic and intellectual expression, while the mere intellectual worker is associated with dependency and passiveness. Mm. Yes, and that would be it. Thank you very much, Amelia. Are there questions now? Yes, Lucy, just let me. I'm running, I'm running. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, that was really uh, interesting. Um, my question is related to gender, and I was wondering whether or not the kind of uh, aristocratic or high-level women, um, if they entered this class of intelligentsia at any point, and if that was ever used as a way to exclude um, the kind of lower-class men that you were talking about, or kind of the opposite, perhaps, or in a way. I think that in terms of gender discrimination, it um, worked pretty much as in other uh, cultural contexts. That is, um, they were considered as a part of intelligentsia, but more as wives and uh, protectors of uh, the family of the men who, uh, with a dominant position. Thank you. Anyone else? But also, of course, in the 20th century, that changes a lot. Yes. Thank you, Emilia. Um, I have a question um, about how um, you elaborated on praise gossip, um, obviously. And um, does that at any point form an ideal image of uh, a person in academia, of a scientist, mm -hmm. maybe, and how that is... Um, um, in lack of a better word, um, typically for the Polish intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, there is this interesting book written by Agata Zesiak. Uh, it's called like Points for um, how to translate that um, from heritage, um, because like during like this um, communist period. Um, it was like heavily criticized uh, by um, intelligentsia uh, that uh, initially we had this system uh, where uh, the people from lower backgrounds could uh, gain points in order to lower up the uh, educational inequalities. And actually this was like a very small sort of uh, um, reform in its scale, but for instance, nowadays, it is still um, demonized in the public discourse. And it is uh, something that like people uh, refer to as, um, as this like terrifying totalitarian communist logic that was like against the Poles, actually. And what Agata Zsek showed was that like it was very minimal um, in the scope and actually intelligentsia held the dominant position in the uh, academia. So the whole habitus and like the whole ethos of, of intelligentsia uh, was heavily reinforced there and um, I'd say that it is reinforced till the present day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Thank you for your questions. And now...
welcome now our second speaker today is Valerie Dahl from uh, the University of Münster. And Valerie will be uh, telling us about drug effects in academia and knowledge workers. Valerie, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. I will be um, talking about precarious employment situations of um, knowledge workers or people working in uh, science and um, how that relates to an academic habitus and subsequently might relate um, to a drag effect in academia. And to bring us all on the same page uh, here, I'm going to briefly <laughs> talk about what um, the drag effect of habitus uh, means. We have a social habitus, that is obviously a phrase coined by Norbert Elias, um, and that means there are patterns of people's behavior, their feelings, and their actions in a specific um, society. And with this habitus comes the principle of social uh, inheritance, meaning that these patterns are being passed down from uh, one generation um, to the next. And um, with a changing society, um, the, inherently, um, there is a balance between the, the transformation of a habitus and the continuity um, of this uh, social habitus, and that changes with uh, society's degree of uh, individualization. And um, as this uh, uh, social habitus becomes more and more uh, complex and multi-layered, it might happen that uh, change doesn't always occur in uh, harmony with uh, societal transformation on uh, institutional and uh, functional uh, levels, and that um, can cause the so-called drag effect of habitus, meaning that the habitus is lagging behind societal uh, transformations. So. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at science as a multi-level phenomenon, uh, as proposed by Nina Bauer and <laughs> colleagues. And uh, if we do it that way, um, in science or in academia, we have a micro level where we look at the everyday work of um, researchers, really tangible uh, processes of research um, and the practical hands-on <laughs> scientific uh, actions. Um, so basically the fun part of uh, research. On the meso level, we uh, um, look at the organization of research. We look uh, at how um, that relates to an organizational typology. And we also look at the influence of research organizations on other levels of actions and uh, communication. And I, uh, today, want to look at the macro level of science or academia, um, where I'm going to uh, shine a spotlight on the peculiarities of science as a whole um, and uh, its um, internal differentiation of uh, science and the relationship between science and other fields such as politics or the economy. And of course, being a, a figurational sociologist at the tensions mm, that can arise between science or academia and these uh, external fields. One uh, of these tensions um, we saw in uh, last summer, uh, especially in Germany, when, the, uh, when we hit uh, a peak in the protest against the so-called Wissenschaftszeitvertragsgesetz, which is a brilliantly German word of uh, saying Academic Fixed Term Contract Act. So in Germany, <laughs> we have a law. Um, this is why I gave you the uh, abbreviation WISZEITVG, which I will be using in uh, forthcoming, um, on forthcoming slides. Um, it basically means that you get six years um, for your doctoral phase, and during these six years, you are allowed to be employed at the university. And then after completing your PhD, you are allowed another six years uh, working at a university, and then uh, you have a choice, a choice uh, in quotation marks, um, that you either move on to the next qualification phase or position, or you're out of academia. And um, this law 
this contract act was originally introduced to keep uh, staff uh, going, um, to keep uh, social mobility um, high, and therefore with this uh, constant turnover of staff members moving from university to university, um, they would take their knowledge and their skill with them and therefore broaden the network of German academia and being the driving force for innovation. Doesn't that sound lovely? <laughs> but um, the people um, protesting against the Westzeit-VG um, have a very different uh, opinion on this because um, as we see in the numbers as well, um, the academic workforce, and I'm excluding full professors and heads of departments here because they have uh, obviously very secure um, employment conditions. So basically the majority of the academic workforce is um, considered to be employed under precarious um, conditions and uh, they are employed uh, in, in temporary conditions and in part-time employment uh, situations and therefore have very uncertain um, career uh, perspectives. As you can see, one of the most recent uh, surveys um, states that, uh, in, at least in Germany, about 92% of all staff members at German universities are temporarily employed, and the situation is even worse for the people under 35 years old, where we have a share of 89, 98, uh, sorry, um, percent. And... Um, Basically, the protesters are saying that uh, being employed under precarious uh, conditions fosters social inequality, and our colleague uh, from Berlin, um, Maria Norkus, has shown that this is especially severe for, um, in regards to uh, gender, class, and uh, race. So, at this point, I'm going to be I'm going to get a bit anecdotal because uh, usually during the winter terms, I teach a course on power and inequality dimensions of working in uh, research. And um, I present my students with these circumstances and uh, pretty soon the question arises, why would you choose a career in academia then, if it is that bad? And uh, much to my enjoyment and much to my students' dismay, there's a lot of literature and uh, material on this, um, stating that this precarious status is mainly accepted due to uh, a low degree of formalization in our work field and also to a self-responsible work organization. <clears throat> and in my opinion, um, most importantly, a high potential for self-realization, meaning being creative and um, maybe the prestige factor plays an, a little uh, role in that as well. And from that stems uh, what I would call an academic habitus. I can uh, go into detail uh, after the talk. Um, but this stems from an ideal image of a researcher, which of course can vary from uh, discipline to discipline. But um, what every one of us has in common is that our career comes with the promise of meritocracy, as I would call it, meaning that you just if you work hard enough, you will achieve, and I guess um, we all know that this is not necessarily true, and it has been uh, said that, um, in, at least in our career, um, going further on the career ladder is much rather a matter of um, succeeding rather than a matter of performing, um, so that we don't have these traditional steps on the career ladder anymore, but instead in our work field we have um, career turning points or uh, marking points that carry a highly selective uh, function. Of course, um, coming back to the this side VG, um, um, the result is you either fit into this academic habitus or you're out of academia. So, um, so now how does the drag effect uh, come into play um, is what I'm, I'm, I want to get uh, to next. And for that, I have to read, uh, I want to read you this um, quote from Max Weber's famous uh, uh, speech turned essay, um, Science as a Vocation, which I think the title explains a lot about his notion um, of that. Um, and he says, and I quote, what has remained and has ever been radically intensified 
is a feature peculiar to a university career. This is the fact that for a lecturer, let alone an assistant, to succeed in rising to the position of a full professor or even the head of an institute is purely a matter of luck. Chance is not the only factor, but its influence is quite exceptional and thus academic life is utter gamble. And if you look at the publishing date here, you can see this is, an, uh, and this is a speech from 1919. Um, so it is over 100 years old. And if we go into text interpretation here, I think it is very clear that even for Max Weber in 1919, this is not a new uh, finding. This has been going on for quite uh, a while. And the reception, especially when uh, science as a vocation turned 100 years old, um, is, well, it's a bit disappointing and disencouraging because as we can see from the second quote on uh, the uh, slide, which is from one of these um, recepting uh, papers, um, and I quote again, we see that um, occupying temporary and poorly paid pre and, pre and postdoc positions, young scientists participate in the ever-evolving machinery of production and the pressure from above, from management, is inevitably passed down to the students. Anyone who has a position within this machinery knows that there are equally well-trained others who are only waiting for someone to drop out and to clear a position. And uh, what this shows us is that um, we have um, not only uh, is our situation in academia still as bad as Max Weber makes it out, in 1919, but also that um, we see a clear uh, indicator for the drag effect of habitus because this is being passed down from management, meaning um, oh, guessing, uh, supposing that the management, uh, being a student or PhD graduate, um, once had to go through this uh, as well. So, so far I've been only presenting you with like the single uh, bits um, of my um, of my uh, argumentation. What I want to do uh, is to conclude by uh, getting a bit more, um, a bit more, um, yeah, not graphic. What is the word? I'm missing the word. Sorry, I'm not a native speaker, but you, you get the idea. We have the academic habitus and the precarious employment situation um, going um, simultaneously to each other. And that has been supposedly going on for a long time. But recently, we see an increased reflexivity and an uh, inequality-sensitive higher education research. And this is where, uh, at least in my opinion, the drag effect kicks in, uh, in the quotation marks. Because then we start to realize, yes, we have been uh, accepting um, precarious employment um, but also we have been adapting uh, um, an academic habitus and somehow uh, due to this um, uh, inequality insensitive, inequality sensitive higher education research, it doesn't quite go with each other anymore. Um, and what I can see in my, um, what I can already, what I already saw in the data that I used for my PhD project um, is that a this seems to be the case at least in uh, physics? I interview people uh, from physics, um, but also that this transformation. So this is a process still very much in effect, um, but the transformation of the social habitus, at least in our field of academia, um, occurs over the course of three uh, professional generations, obviously relating to the informalization hypotheses. Uh, here. So this is just the basic idea, um, basically. So what I want to do next, if I get the chance, uh, is uh, A, keeping an eye on the formal level, because um, you may or may not know that we have a newly founded uh, government in Germany who have promised to re-evaluate the so-called Zeit-VG, um, and I'm very curious to see what they uh, will find. Um, and on an informal level, I called it, uh, of course, in quotation marks, I want to do a targeted 
uh, data collection. I want to do further research on this and see if it's true, especially um, uh, taking into concern uh, an international uh, level, because as we heard, there seems to be uh, a bit of variation from country to country. So this would be it so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. And now the floor is open for questions. Yes. Just, I just keep coming, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, really interesting and uh, yeah, can relate a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wondered if you'd considered also a, a fact that might slightly undermine the the top-down effect, which would be the increase in sheer, sheer numbers of students who want to go on to become academic researchers, just in terms of the percentage of people going to universities, getting more and more, going to masters, per, you know, there's just a lot more of us and not necessarily more positions. So I wondered if that might cause, yeah, undermine the drag as part of it. I would argue completely differently and say this is uh, the reason why the drag effect is still in effect because the academic habitus is um, the rule of the game that we all have to play supposedly to succeed in academia and um, so and this is what I mean we we still act accordingly to what we are supposed to do what we see our um, our supervisors our older colleagues. Uh, doing and they made it, so why shouldn't I make it uh, following this uh, this habitus? And I think this only gets worse because there are so many uh, undergrads, graduate students, PhD students, because then the fighting will be even harsher. Just, just a, a suggestion, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got it. Different question. I mean, I th I would agree with you on the analysis, and I would point another point because, like maybe in the 70s and 80s, if you're looking at the work that has to be done due to underfunding, and what a person can be done that originally only affected the um, um, short-term contract employees, but since the early mid 1990s, uh, everybody's workload has so much increased. So I think part of the um, how the drug effect um, uh, works is that you have within the working fields, you have sort of a power balance which has to do with underfunding. So the actual question is about like, um, what do you suggest how the underfunding works? Just saying that because um, um, like you remember, we talked about like the Berlin, New Berlin law and they just um, made the law um, that if you don't provide a postdoctoral research, if you're in a permanent position, you cannot employ them anywhere, but they fail to provide the money, which basically resulted instead of people having precarious work, just them being unemployed with a one month's notice. Um, so the actual issue, would, what would you suggest how, the, um, how this imbalance between academia and politics can be broken up? Because that's the real issue, isn't it? It's like, Give me a second, because obviously I'm not a politician and um, I don't have the final answer. Uh, but I mean, to make to, if I want to go easy on this, the, the answer would be give academia more money, give research more funding. <laughs> we have, but we have been rightly saying it for decades, haven't we? <laughs> so, um, yeah, as I said, I don't have a final uh, answer to that, but I will definitely take it into consideration uh, it, when I f eventually get to explore uh, this a bit more. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Because if there aren't, I, I just a very quick one drawing on the problem of underfunding that Nina raised. I mean, because my impression from working in the German academia for a few years was that there are there is actually a lot of money flowing in, in uh, terms of excellence initiative and, and stuff, but this money is not really channeled to creating permanent positions. So what what is the political explanation for that? I mean, cui prodes, to quote Stefanie, in whose interest is that, politically speaking? 
politically speaking, I think it relates to the element of uh, entrepreneurship that has been introduced into um, German academia, uh, taking um, uh, the US and the UK as a model, because uh, we can see very clearly um, in, in um, the laws of um, uh, for the universities that um, it is not only um, that, uh, that the uh, politicians don't only have a wish for us to make uh, to produce something um, to have an actual tangible output from our research uh, but it, it, that it seems almost mandatory that that uh, is the case which is especially hard for people like us working in sociology or uh, social science um, and uh, I've worked on a third party funding project in uh, in the department of physics before and where it's completely different because it is very easy to produce. Uh, I, I worked, uh, I had uh, colleagues working in photonics and they produced um, mediums, crystals, in which they could store hundreds of terabytes of data in a single crystal, which is obviously very useful. Um, and we as a social, uh, as a group of social scientists, we can't really compete with, with a brilliant <laughs> innovation like that. Not to say that we don't do necessary uh, research as well, but it's not as um, marketable. So I think that is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If there aren't any more questions, then I think we may thank both our speakers and close this session and we will reconvene in this room after the break.